Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome simultaneously to our seventh global online uh, biodiversity informatics seminar and to day four of our public health applications course. Um, decided to combine these two events because our speaker today is uh, going to speak about, um, about topics quite relevant to both. Uh, Sergio Estay is a professor at the Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia. Uh, I had the pleasure both of meeting him and of visiting him this summer and very much enjoyed our conversations. So um, it was an easy thought to invite him to give um, this, this seminar. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, insect population ecology and the changing climate. So um, I'm going to pass this over to Sergio and leave you in his hands. And I'll simply remind you to send uh, questions that you might have for Sergio to biodivtraining at gmail.com. And we'll have a session immediately after the uh, this seminar for any questions that you might send. Okay, all yours, Sergio. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in the in this uh, biodiversity informatics seminar. Um, I'm a, mainly a population ecologist. Uh, I work in the Austral University of Chile in the south of Chile, and in this talk, um, first I will share my screen. Okay, I hope you are are seeing my screen. Um, in this talk, I will summarize uh, the last five years of my research. Uh, during this time, I have been working in the influence of climate on population dynamic of insect, especially insect pests. Um, in the first part, uh, I will explore potential explanation to some changes observed in the pattern of fluctuation of some aphid populations uh, through the use of very, very simple models, population models. Uh, in the second part, I will explore the effect of temperature on, on key population parameters, uh, specifically uh, uh, I will talk about the potential influence of changes in, in, in thermal variability. And at the end of this talk, uh, I will try to connect both parts uh, in a simple body of predictions about the effect of thermal variability on population dynamics. Um, first, let me give some context. Um, all of us know the importance of the important role of climate on on the life history of ectotherms. Um, different aspects like physiology, for example, metabolic rate, um, behavior, motility, for example, or the request of refugees, um, or interactions like uh, predator-prey interactions are clearly affected by the climate. Um, the understanding uh, of this influence uh, is very important, especially now when we are trying to, to minimize the negative effects of climate, uh, of global warming, of climate change. Um, if we focus on global warming, we know that we can summarize the major effects as changes in distribution and or abundances of a species. Um, this is because by, by modifying the, cl the climatic condition at some localities, uh, for example, currently um, considered suitable for some species, 
uh, they will turn in unsuitable areas. Uh, and on the other side, uh, some unsuitable areas will turn in suitable ones. Um, this, chain in, this change in suitability of some localities uh, will promote uh, several events of extinction and invasions. Nowadays, um, several studies have shown these potential changes around the world. Um, in the case of insect pests, changes in distribution and abundances uh, has been predicted to areas as different as, as North America, for example, Canada. In, in the slide, uh, the map at the left side, uh, Europe, the map at the right side of your screen, or the southern corner of South America. As a population ecologist, uh, one of my major interests is the expected changes in the long-term dynamic of uh, that natural population. Uh, during my PhD, I was working in the influence of climate on the population dynamic of some aphids in, in the United Kingdom. Um, I was using the, the amazing database of the Rohanstedt Institution uh, which contain the abundances of several species of aphids along UK. Uh, using this database, I modeled the, the dynamics of a specific aphid, um, tuberculatus annulatus, the, the oak aphid, uh, for several localities in the UK. Uh, however, um, the best part of my work with aphids occurred after my thesis. Someday, we were looking at the time series of other aphids when we noticed something very interesting. Let me show you. Um, if you look at the right corner, right uh, upper corner of this slide, you see the time series of abundances of uh, Elodium avietinum, the, the green spruce aphid. Uh, if you look carefully, you can notice that in the middle of the 80s, uh, in this graph, you have in the x-axis time and in the y-axis abundance of aphids. Uh, if you look uh, at the graph, you can notice that in the middle of the 80s, the amplitude of the oscillation suddenly increased. Uh, in the second case, in the in the graph at the right lower graph, uh, corner, uh, you can see a quite similar pattern of increased amplitude uh, in the time series of abundances. Of, in this case, for Drepanosiphum platanoides, the um, sycamore aphid. In this case, we can observe that the increase in variance occur at the end of the 90s. Uh, when my friends and I saw this graph, um, immediately knew that something very interesting occurred in these populations. Uh, these sudden increases in population variability uh, are very important, not only from a theoretical point of view, but also for applied ecology. Uh, a higher variability implies a higher probability of extinction. If your target is conservation, for example, then um, an increase in variability is a very bad, new, uh, bad news. Uh, on the contrary, uh, if you are a pest manager, an increase in population variability means a higher frequency or a higher intensity of pest outbreaks. For all this reason, the study of this, uh, this phenomenon was quite interesting and, uh, and to, to try to discover the mechanism behind these changes in population variability uh, is, is, uh, is very important. We start the search for explanation with uh, the basic ecological theory of population dynamics. 
let me show you a very simple model. Uh, if we use the Riker model, a very simple model, um, in this case we are using the nonlinear version of the Riker model here in the lower part of the text. This model said that the abundance n at time t plus 1 is equal to the abundance at time t times the exponent of Rm, which is the intrinsic, intrinsic population growth rate or the maximum population growth rate expected for this species in a specific locality, times 1 minus the abundance at time t divided by the equilibrium density, which is the long-term um, abundance expected, the, the expected abundance. And this, this, um, this di division is to the power of q. q is a coefficient of curvature yeah, that define if the, this function is concave or convex. Uh, these three parameters, these three key parameters are M, Q, and K, uh, are the characteristics that govern the dynamics of population uh, that evolve in this way. Let me show you a small simulation to to explore some explanation for the phenomenon of increasing variability. In the third case, uh, we can observe that if k, the equilibrium density, increase, also the variance of the dynamic increase. I hope you can see the, the simulation. If I increase key, let me start a, a low value of K. If I increase K, variance also increase. Yeah? All the rest being equal. This effect of K in the variance has been previously described uh, and is known as the, the Taylor's power law of the mean. After Ray, uh, Roy Taylor, uh, who published uh, this paper in the 60s, and who works in Rohamst institution. Um, this mathematical law says that any increase in the mean will cause a proportional, a proportional in the logarithm scale, uh, a, a proportional increase in the variance. Therefore, uh, our first potential explanation for the observer pattern is that the change in population variability is a consequence of an increase in the equilibrium density uh, of that system. Uh, for example, due to enrichment uh, of the system because there are more food or there are more refugees or etc. In the second case, we can see that all the rest being equal, an increment in Rm or in Q produce an increment in population variability. If I increment Rm in this simulation, variability also increase dramatically. Oh. However, uh, in this case, uh, this case looks quite different than the previous than the previous one where where k change. In this case, the increment in variability is not proportional to the increase in Rm. The relationship is strongly nonlinear. Um, this situation was first described in, in in the classic paper of Robert May in the in in the seventies. Uh, in this paper, he demonstrated that the influence of Rm on the dynamic behavior of a system uh, of the very simple system, the linear version of the Ricard equation, um, is governed by Rm. In our case, uh, using this nonlinear version, it's demonstrable, uh, but I won't do the math now, that the system depends of the product of Rm times Q. Or in simple words, that the variance depends on birth and death rates 
or uh, orient on the parameter Q. And also that the chain is not proportional but operates by thresholds. Um, this is summarized uh, in this graph in the x-axis. Uh, sorry. In, in this graph, in the right side of the of your screen, we can see that uh, in the x-axis, we have the estimated value of Q for some population. In the y-axis, the estimated value of Rm. Uh, and each curve, that in each uh, black solid line, um, black solid curve, uh, represents a threshold separating different dynamics behaviors. In the first area, I don't know if you see my cursor. In the first area here, we have a behavior that is called monotonic damping. Monotonic damping is characterized because if we have some equilibrium density k, and we start to uh, to 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 iterate the population at some level the approximation of the population to the equilibrium density is very smooth, very soft. Yeah. In the second area, between the first two thresholds, we have uh, something that is called damped oscillation. Damped oscillation because the population reach the equilibrium, but not smoothly that in the first case, but doing some oscillation that damped in time until the population reach the equilibrium. Obviously, variability here is higher than variability in the first case. Uh, in the third area, we have a behavior that is called two-point cycle. In this case, a population never reaches the equilibrium, but oscillates around, around it. Um, of course, we have many other thresholds and until uh, we, we can reach the chaotic dynamics that was described by May. Now we have two hypotheses to explain the observer pattern. Um, to evaluate which is the best, we follow three steps. Uh, first, despite we can observe a change in the amplitude of the fluctuations, uh, first we need to define that these observed change are real. Yeah? are a statistically significant change of variance. Um, after this, we have to determine which of the population parameter is responsible for the change. And finally, we, uh, we tried to evaluate potential changes in the stability uh, of this uh, real system, the, the AFIS population systems. Um, we decided to work with the same species, uh, Latobium abietinum and Drepanocephus platanoides, uh, and we evaluate as many localities as possible. Um, um, in this case, is localities with a uh, time series long enough to to allow our analysis. Um, finally, we work with ten localities for Latobium and 11 localities for Drepanosiphon along the uh, United Kingdom. The first problem was how to test for a real change of variance. Um, to do this, we borrow an algorithm used, used in, uh, in econometrics uh, to test for changes of variance in in financial time series, uh, this algorithm, algorithm uh, due to Inclan and Thiao, uh, is based in the idea of a Brownian bridge. Uh, a Brownian bridge is a mathematical, very similar to a Brownian motion, but with the difference that the the initial and the final point of the path are predefined. Uh, therefore, uh, if the if the variance is the same at the start and at the end of the of our time series, uh, then uh, it should behave as a Brownian bridge. Um, in this simulation, in the right side of your screen, there is 
a Brownian bridge with a starting point here and, a, and the end point here. Uh, if I simulate many of these Brownian bridge, I can define in, with many, many simulations the confidence interval for the null hypothesis that our observer variance behaves as a Brownian bridge. Uh, if at any point of time our time series is above or below the confidence interval for the Brownian bridge, then we have a real change of variance. Um, using the Inclan and Tiao algorithm, uh, we first determine uh, if a real change occurs. And also, we determine where in time, in which year, this change occurred. Uh, then we split the time series in two parts at the point of the change and fit a nonlinear regression model for each segment uh, with the estimated parameters before and after the change. Uh, we could determine which parameter is the responsible for the change in variance. And what did we find? Our result shows that 60% of the time series shows some level of change of variance. Uh, this is a lot. It's really a lot. Um, in this uh, graph, there are some ex some examples of the analysis. Uh, in the x-axis, we have time. And in the y-axis, we have the DK statistic that is a estimator of variance. Uh, when DK is below the confidence interval, uh, we have an increase in variance. And if DK is above the confidence interval, we have a decrease in variance. In these two examples, we observe an increase in variance. There are, these are two localities, uh, and the time series correspond to drepanocephus platinoid. The the Drepanocephum platinoides. Um, also, it's important to say that uh, most changes uh, occur at the end of the 90s, uh, which, which uh, suggests that there was approximately a simultaneous change along all UK. Another interesting result is that just in one locality, we observe a uh, reduction in variance in, in Dundee, in Scotland, uh, when, where both aphid species show a reduction in variance. Uh, in, this, uh, in this ugly table, uh, we summarize the estimated parameters for each locality uh, that show a change, uh, that showed uh, a change in variance. Uh, this table show population parameter uh, before and after the change. Um, but the more important message from this table is that the change in variance is different, uh, is driving for different parameters according to the species. Uh, for Elatobium avietinum, uh, changes are promoted mm, mainly for changes in K in the equilibrium density. But for Drepanocephus platinoides, uh, changes, platinoides, uh, changes are, are mainly promoted for changes in, in the population, in the maximum population growth rate. Uh, in some detail, we have this. These are the same graphs that I showed you before. In the x axis, the estimated value of the parameter Q. In the y axis, the estimated value of the Rm. Uh, we have a graph per locality. Uh, in this case, it's four time series of Elatobium. Uh, inside the graph, we observe an arrow. Uh, the base of the arrow represents the values of Q and Rm before the change of variance. And the end of the arrow, the, the top of the arrow, uh, represent the values of uh, Q and Rm after the change in variance. Uh, we can observe that despite there are, despite some imp 
important changes in the magnitude or RM increments in RM, no locality uh, underwent uh, a change in the dynamic behavior um, because uh, no arrow crossed a threshold. The, the parameters RM and Q are always in the same area. Okay? Some are close to, to some threshold but never close uh, never cross uh, the threshold. On the other hand, here, these are time series for uh, localities for drepanosiphon. Uh, we observe that in several cases, uh, arrows cross a threshold. For example, in Bruce Barn, in here, in Rohamsted, and in Gradle, we can see that the system before the change are in the area of uh, monotonic damping. But after the change of variance, they are, are located in the area of damped oscillation, uh, which means the system underwent a complete change in 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 their dynamic uh, in its uh, in its dynamic behavior. Um, to to summarize um, this part, um, I show how popul um, uh, um, I explain sh how uh, population dynamics is is not constant. Uh, for a species in a locality, which obviously is not new, uh, uh, but we show that this change could be um, quite abrupt and occurs in ecological time in 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 a few years. Uh, also, um, our results are important for for apply ecologies or for peers. Uh, what happens if some pests around the world begin to increase in variability? Uh, this implies that more objects or, or maybe implies that uh, there are more intense objects and this means that uh, we really need to develop more tools to minimize the, um, the, the, the negative effect of global warming is it's, it's, it's something that is uh, urgent. This is the first part. Um, in the second part, uh, this is mainly about um, after this this first study in, in the lab, uh, we began to think in how the environment could drive these changes um, in the population parameters. Uh, of course, in the context of global warming, the usual suspect is temperature. Uh, uh, in the context of climate change, uh, most studies are focused in, in the impact of a change in mean temperature. Uh, uh, but global warming and climate change are, are not just about changes in mean temperature. Oh, oops. Um, several authors have proposed three basic scenarios for global warming. Um, the first scenario uh, here in the first graph here proposes that uh, there is a change in average temperature but no change in, in the variance of the temperature in thermal variability. Uh, in the second scenario there is no change in mean temperature, but there is a change in uh, thermal variability. Finally, in the third scenario, both mean and variance change. Yeah? Uh, using this idea, we decide to explore how different population parameters uh, could change under each of these scenarios. Um, for ectotherms, it, it is well, well known that the relationship of population parameters and temperature can be represented by um, a thermal, thermal performance curve, uh, a TP, uh, like this in, in this slide. Uh, 
the, uh, in this graph, uh, we see the in the x-axis the mean temperature, and in the y-axis Rm, the intrinsic population growth rate. Um, LTPC are described as a unimodal asymmetric curves, and we can identify four key points in this curve, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the first key point is the thermal lower limit here. The thermal lower limit is the point that marks uh, the temperature below which uh, the organism cannot survive. Uh, the second point is the upper limit. Above, the, above this mean temperature, organism again cannot survive. The third point is the maximal performance point, the maximum value in this case of Rm that the, this organism can reach in the thermal environment. And the projection in the x-axis is called the optimum temperature. And the last point for me is very important. I uh, is, is um, at, at, at my knowledge never uh, before our research was considered a, an important point is the infection point. Uh, this point is where the concavity of the curve change, or where the curve change from acceleration to deceleration to, to deceleration. Um, Using this curve, we can predict uh, how, how Rm will change uh, uh, with a change in, tem in temperature, uh, in, in mean temperature. Um, but the question is, uh, what about thermal variability? No, okay. um, this is a classic thermal performance curve obtained, for example, in an experiment that represents in the x-axis mean temperature and in the y-axis Rm, the intrinsic population growth rate. How a population reacts to a, uh, to a warming? If I increase mean temperature, the, the dot uh, marks uh, the performance of a given population. If I increase mean, the performance move along the curve. And so we can predict how Rm in this case could react to an increment in mean temperature. But if we incorporate thermal variability, things are much more different. If I increase variability, we can see that TPC change completely in relation to the TPC at constant temperature. Okay, this is because uh, TPC is a not linear uh, function, and an inherent property of nonlinear system is the uh, Jensen's inequality. The Jensen's inequality uh, says that in, in, a, in the accelerating part of a curve, uh, in, in our case, uh, between the lower limit and the inflection point, if we add variance, we will obtain an increase in performance here. Constant temperature before the inflection point, which I expect this here. If I increase variability, performance is higher. But in the in the decelerating part of the curve, for example, above the inflection point, if I increase variability, the effect um, Rm will decrease. Okay. This is, is, is clear in this graph, in, in the 3D graph and in the contour plot. And, and we can see here how the TPC completely changed 
at different levels of variability. You can see that the area under the curve is smaller as I increase the level of variability. There is a very there is a, a, a different curve for each level of variability. The same that in the contour plot. Combining the Jensen inequality with our global warming scenarios, um, we have now three potential scenarios for the response of our M to global warming. Um, in the first scenario, a change in mean temperature, but not a change in thermal variability, we predict that an increment in temperature will increment our M for population in localities where environmental temperature is between the lower limit and the point of maximal performance. In the first graph, in the A graph, population in the red area here, red vertical lines, will react positively to an increment in temperature. Or in other words, if I increment temperature, RM will increase. But between the maximal performance point and the upper limit, the effect will be negative. If I increment mean temperature, Rm will decrease. In the second case, in the graph B in the middle, uh, in this scenario of no change in mean but a change in variance, an increment in variance will increase Rm between the lower limit and inflection point, the red area, the red vertical lines. From here, to the lower limit. Uh, but Rm will decrease between the inflection point and the upper limit, the blue area, blue horizontal lines. Uh, finally, in the third scenario, when, when mean and variance increase, the effect on Rm will be positive. Rm will increase uh, between the lower limit and the inflection point will be negative from the maximal performance point to the upper limit, but between the inflection point and the point of maximal performance, the effect will be mixed. And the net result will depend on the magnitude of the change in mean and variance. The uncertainty here, here is higher than before the inflection point or after the maximal performance point. Um, how to test this prediction, this, in some sense, uh, null models? Um, well, we use a three-way approach. Um, first, perform an experiment with model population of three volume and drosophila. Uh, second, uh, collecting data from the literature to perform a kind of meta-analysis. And finally, comparing this data with our predictions. Um, our results uh, show, show that most of our predictions really occurred. Um, in the first graph to the left, uh, our experiment showed that the value of Rm in three volume is lower at uh, at variable temperature than a constant temperature, despite the average temperature was the same. Uh, in the second graph to the right, uh, we see that Rm in Drosophila is higher under variable temperature if average temperature is below the inflection point. In this case, the, the value is 17 degrees, 17 Celsius degrees. The tr this treatment is uh, 17 degrees constant, 17 degrees variable, 24 deg degrees constant, 24 degrees variable. Uh, before the inflection point, an increment in variability, increment in R max. But uh, Rm is lower when average temperature is above the inflection point. Uh, in the meta-analysis, um, first we obtain just three data sets 
uh, that combine constant and variable temperatures measured at several average temperatures. Uh, the data set was, was the, the data in the literature is so, so scarce. We obtained three data sets, um, Acirtusifum pisum and aphid, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, and Helicoverpa armigera is a moth. Um, due to the small data set, we only compare qualitatively the curves with our predictions. Uh, despite this is not the best data set, um, we can see some similarities with our predictions, like um, reductions in performance in the case of Acirtosifum pisum and Helicoverpa, and changes in thermal limits in all cases. Um, Finally, uh, we propose some formulas to estimate the impact of an increase in mean temperature on RM. Um, first, let me explain that I, I'm talking about RM, but uh, this could be applied to any other population parameter. In fact, in, in, in some of our studies, we test uh, these ideas in other population parameters that like um, generation time, like the instantaneous rate of increase, etc. Uh, as I said, uh, we propose some formulas to estimate the impact of an increase in mean temperature on RM in this case, uh, the impact of an increment in an increment in thermal variability on RM and the impact of changes in mean and variance on RM. I know the equations look uh, very ugly, but believe me, it, it is very easy to use them. Okay. Um, now um, I will I will try to connect the two parts of my talk um, in these diagrams. Uh, if there are just an increments in mean temperature in the future, uh, we can expect that for population between the lower thermal limit and the optimal uh, RM, on the optimum temperature, uh, RM will increase. And this could generate, uh, in, in this area, in the red area, and this could generate a destabilizing effect on the population. At the right side, the red arrow. This is because RM increase and it turns easier to cross some of the thresholds that divide the different uh, dynamic behavior. On the other hand, between the optimum and the upper limit in the, in the area of horizontal uh, blue lines, there is an stabilizing effect because RM will decrease. The blue arrow in the graph at the right. Um, in, the in the case of just an increase of thermal variability, the positive effect for population, there is a positive effect for population between um, the lower limit and infection point. And this is a destabilizing effect because RM will increase, but is stabilizing for population between the inflection point, again, the blue area, and the upper limit. Uh, that is represented here again for the blue arrow. But finally, uh, if mean and variance increase, and variance increase uh, this is the stabilizing effect is expected between the lower limit and the inflection point because in this area, the red area, a RM increase. Also, a stabilizing effect is expected between the optimum and the upper limit because RM will decrease. But between the inflection point and the optimum, uh, the stability of the population will depend of the magnitude of the change of mean and variance. In some cases, if mean increase and variance increase, but in a lower proportion, the effect could be positive, but in other case, the effect could be negative. The green area between the inflection point here, between the, between the inflection point and the maximum is a 
really uncertain area to predict the potential effect. And that is represented for the green arrow at the right graph. Um, well, this is, this is my talk. If you are not uh, bored enough uh, with this talk, these are some of the papers that contains all the details of this research. Um, all the papers are available in, in my ResearchGate account. And again, thanks so much for your attention. And if you have any question, uh, I will try to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. That was quite interesting. Um, everybody, please do send uh, questions. This is the, the one aspect of this Google Hangouts um, format that I tend not to like, which is that we don't get enough direct interaction. Um, but if you have questions, please send them. Uh, I'm not seeing anything yet. Um, and usually, Sergio, what happens is that we we um, call it quits on the questions, and then about five questions come in. So, uh, if you don't mind, I will pass those on to you if they um, if they do happen. Okay. Um. Um, <laughs> you have to go to. And no, I'm I'm <laughs> I, I'm trying to. There you go. To, the to see I, I get, uh, okay, I hear. There you go. No questions. Okay, everybody, you have about a minute in which to send questions for Sergio, and otherwise, uh, you'll have to do it by email. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, if you have any question uh, tomorrow or wherever, um, I'm available by email. Uh, it's very easy, and usually I I can answer any question uh, quite quickly. Um, I don't know the next step down. Well, I I think that's it, and I will thank you very much. This. This format is a little bit uh, disconcerting because you can't see your audience or interact with your audience. <laughs> um, but we've usually had very good interactions after all, the talk. All, all people are sleeping now. <laughs> no, nobody's asleep. And those who were, who were tuned in, I'm sure, were quite interested. Um, I'm going to thank you very, very much. And I will be thinking about what you've had to say. Um, and I'll look forward to talking you, with you about these issues in the future. Thank you so much. See Thank you. Take care.